letting them in now. Um, hello everyone, welcome to Tech 2020 and to our game-based learning workshop. So we will be starting in another two minutes and we'll just be waiting for a few more participants to join us in. Hello. Okay, we have a few participants here, uh, about 23 people have joined us in. So, hello everyone, we would like to welcome all of you to Tech 2020 and to our workshop on game-based learning. We are so very happy to have all of you with us here today, uh, joining us from all parts of the world. Uh, thank you, especially for taking out the time for us on this Sunday morning. I, I mean, Sunday is uh, pretty sacrosanct for most of us and you've... Uh, chosen to dedicate it to learning so that's something and especially given it to us so that's something we're really grateful for and um, I'm Anurati and uh, with my co-facilitator Vignesh. Vignesh if you could pop up on the screen to show your face to everybody yeah that's Vignesh. Um, so um, before we get started we would like to know you a little bit and for you to know a, a bit about us both of us, uh, Vignesh and I, work in the Games for Learning team at UNESCO MGIP. For those who missed out on the first two days of Tech 2020, um, UNESCO MGIP is the Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Education for Peace and Sustainable Development. We are a Category 1 research institute under UNESCO. We work with the UN 
sustainable development goal um, target 4.7 which basically focuses on education for building peaceful and sustainable societies across the world so one of the ways that we do this is by developing innovative digital pedagogies that promote social and emotional learning and one of these many innovative digital pedagogies is the highly innovative use of game based learning and using games especially commercial games to promote social and emotional learning which would be the focus of uh, today's workshop so um a little bit about uh, both of us so about me uh, i'm anurathi i'm a learning experience designer a product designer and new media artist i have been working in the field of education technology and design for about 4 years now and uh, at unesco mgip i create game based courses which aim at enhancing sel skills so basically it's my job to find out ways to use storytelling games interactive activities along with good instructional design to make online learning fun and engaging when i'm not doing that i uh, like to draw um, i like to read and i like to uh, create things whether it be small games or um, create something out of uh, craft something out of paper and things like that uh, today i'm feeling really grateful um, to uh, to have uh, to share this time with all of you and i really look forward to today's workshop and i hope to learn as much as from you as i hope that you take away from us uh, so i will now let vignesh uh, introduce himself uh, yeah, over to you vignesh hello everyone uh, good morning good afternoon good evening wherever you've uh, joined in from uh, my name is vignesh and i work with anurathi in the games for learning team um, my official designation is that of a national ict specialist uh, but most of my role most of my time is spent in designing these game based courses and conducting scientific studies to gauge their efficacy as well uh, for the past one and a half years or so we have now been designing these game based courses and we have sort of uh, optimized our process and today we hope to share that with you so that you can take it back with you and implement it in your own classrooms with your students and if you are a game designer you can probably see how games and learning sort of are not very different they are the same thing um i used to work as a uh, research scientist in photonics and i have now i'm pretty grateful to be working uh, in fields that i am very passionate about both video games and learning thank you i hope you have a great workshop uh, i'll be seeing you again soon thank you um yes oh. um thank you for switching the slides uh <laughs> i see uh, someone taking a screenshot of our slides we'll try to make them as playful and fun as possible um uh, i think mostly for ourselves <laughs> but i hope it's funny for you as well so a few quick housekeeping rules uh, please mute yourself for the duration of uh, this workshop when you aren't speaking this is just to avoid any background noise that might uh hinder the experience um you're free to unmute yourself when you say something or when you wish to contribute to the discussion or have a specific question to ask um the mute button appears as a mic on the extreme left of your zoom window um uh the way you would uh, you know you could raise your hand when you wish to ask a question uh, either to uh, me or vignesh or to any of the other uh, attendees of this workshop um it would help us uh, moderate the discussion better if you would just raise your hand whenever needed we this is a 2 hour workshop uh, and we will have uh, a 5 minute break roughly around uh, midway so it's um, 11 am in india so about noon uh, is the is the time for our first for our break which is about 5 minutes and we would encourage you to keep on posting on the chat uh, for any questions that pop up in your head or any insights um, that come across your way uh, in the duration of this workshop um, another note that this meeting is being recorded for quality purposes so i hope i have everyone's consent uh, if anyone um, does not want that please um, feel free to switch off your video but we would highly encourage you to keep your video on um, it would help us uh, know you better see your reactions uh, and help us have a better interaction um, Uh, otherwise uh, you know we we feel that we're talking in a blank room for 2 hours it would humanize uh, the process a lot more uh, so 
yeah, I think now the rules um, are out of the way. So now we would really like to get to know you a little bit about you, uh, your name, uh, where you're from, and a quick feelings check-in. So check in with yourself about how you're feeling today. Uh, Vignesh would be posting a link uh, to a collaborative uh, Jamboard, which is a tool where you can all stick post-its and see everyone else's post-its. Uh, and you're free to uh, use a particular emoji that uh, most, uh, you know, most associates with your current mood right now. Um, so Vignesh, can we have the link on the chat? Yeah, it's, it's there. And if you could switch the slide to, uh, yes. So this is uh, what the Jamboard uh, looks like. There are a few scattered emojis on the side and you can drag the emoji and paste, post, paste it right next to your post-it. And into your post-it, you can write your name, where you're coming from and your current emotion. So let's see how this Jamboard fills up. There are a few uh, poker faces and a few uh, faces of no expression. So it's okay if you're unsure about how you're feeling today or you're just feeling okay and have no particular strong emotions today. Uh, so feel free to use that emoji as well. I see a large smiley. It's, it's just very good to see a huge smiley here on the board. Okay, two people from the Philippines have joined us today. Hello, hello from India. Mongolia. <laughs> oh, hello. <laughs> there are some people typing on the chat as well. There's Mohammed from Sri Lanka. There, there's Vanita Mani from Sri Lanka. Um, from Delhi. A lot of teachers have joined in uh, to this workshop. Okay, some people can't access the Jamboard right now. That's all right. You can just use the chat to type in uh, how you're feeling, your name, uh, what you do, where you're from. Uh, feel free to use the chat instead. Okay, someone from Pakistan. Three people from Sri Lanka. We have so about 30 have people. Everyone. Yeah, very nice to see people from all over the world. Yeah. Okay, so um, if I could get a quick reaction uh, of um, how many people here are educators. So. So on the reactions, uh, you see uh, you, on, the, on the bottom of your Zoom window, the Zoom bar, so on the extreme right, you'll see this uh, emoji uh, and there's uh, reactions written. So if you press on it, you can react um, to whatever I say. So there, are, there is a, a clap or a thumbs up. So whoever here is an educator or a curriculum designer or um, formally working in the education, formal education space, uh, I would request you to um, put a clap uh, reaction. If, um, can I see some reactions? I would love to know how many of us here are educators. Okay, I see one clap and one person for a coffee break. <laughs> I hope you've all had your coffee. I've certainly had mine. Mm. Okay, another clap. You can also just unmute yourself and just uh, on the count of three. One, two, three. Okay, I guess this, this activity works better uh, in a physical space. All right, so I guess um, a lot of people from all over the world, uh, we're just so happy to have you with us uh, here today. 
um, and I think it's such a gift to be able to meet people from across the world, even under a pandemic, uh, and we're really grateful for that. Uh, so let's um, let's move to the first poll. So uh, Vignesh would be posting a poll uh, that would appear as a pop-up on your screen. Uh, the poll is a simple one, which is related to games and learning. So there are three statements that you have to choose from. There is um, whether you think that all games can be used for learning, some games can be used for learning, or no games can be used for learning. So you have to choose one out of the three, uh, and the poll should pop up onto your screen. Vignesh, are we getting a few responses? Yeah, we are getting responses very quickly. We have 24 out of 31. Okay. We'll hold on for another 15 seconds. Uh, if the, it's an anonymous poll, so we'd encourage everyone to just share your thoughts, even if you think no games can be used for learning. We hope to change your minds by the end of this workshop. Yeah, completely anonymous. Uh, I hope everyone has access to the poll. Uh, if in case it isn't, uh, you can't see it or use, using it on a device, um, phone device, uh, please feel free to use the chat. The three options are all games can be used for learning, some games can be used for learning, or no games. So you can just type all games, some games, and no games. So we have 83% people who voted, 25 out of 30. I'll just share the results. Can you see the results, Anurati? No, so, I can't. So there are 14 people who have voted for all games can be used for learning. That's 56% of our audience today. And 11 people have voted for some games can be used for learning. That is 44%. Um, and none of them Fortunately, I have voted for no games can be used for learning. So it's a bit less challenging, okay, but makes, yeah. Makes our job much easier. Uh, so uh, it's great to see that either you're on that spectrum of, of you know, of having some buy-in from for games or some games or all games. Uh, today we'll discuss what kind of games, what can be, what are the kinds of games that can be used for learning, what kinds of learning, what are the various ways it can either augment or improve learning. Um, so great, it's, it's good to have a feeler of um, games versus uh, learning. Okay, so we have another activity uh, for you on games versus uh, learning. So I would, here I would invite you to reflect a little bit and think about some features of games, uh, of popular games or other games that you might have played they could eat, even be sports uh, that you enjoyed as a child or physical games like say carom or chess uh, that you you loved, um, you loved to play or you, as a child or even now you love to play. And what are some of the features of those games that you would like to be a part of learning environments? So uh, think about um, your experiences of playing games and uh, some of the features that would make them so ideal to be used inside a learning environment. So we have, um, a, so Vignesh has posted uh, the link on the chat. So if you could just go there and post your thoughts. On the Padlet, there are sticky notes on the left-hand side, uh, the far uh, far left. Uh, now Vignesh, could you post the, yeah, so the cursor is uh, on the, Sticky note, yeah, here. And you can just add a sticky note uh, to type in your thoughts. So think about some features of games that you really liked, um, whether it be say something like Candy Crush or Carom or um, any sport games or basketball or all of that. And some features of those games that make them would you would like to have in a learning environment. Uh, Vignesh, can you uh, change yeah, the settings? Yeah. yeah, I'll just do that. Give me a second, sorry.
Yeah, it should work now. Let us know if it works for you. So here I would like to think what, what, are, what are some of the exact features, you know, as a child, you might have found that, you know, they're so addictive or you love to play, play them because all of your friends were playing them. And then you got so involved in being the best at it. Uh, so so I, I would like you to think about the features of those specific games. So think about the games and then think of some of the specific features of the game. So for example, if you're a teacher, you, you must be like, oh my God, I, I wish uh, I was say a sports teacher, their work is, uh, you know, they already have, have such a buy-in from the students and everyone wants to play. So uh, I'm so envious of, um, of, uh, of a person who has play uh, as a part of their learning environment. I've sent the link again for those who could not access it. Please try again, I'll change the settings. We see team, collaboration, curiosity. Not too easy and not too hard. So there's a sense of challenge there. Fun is absolutely crucial. Someone says leadership. Okay, on the chat, someone says that they have, a, have an impact on emotional development, social development, cognitive development, so all kinds of development. Um, I think this, um, this is team all games. This is someone coming from team all games. That's my guess. Easy UX, yeah, that's something that's not stated often. It's just natural for anyone to get into a game, understand it without needing a rule book or a guidebook to explain everything about it. Yeah. And I think that's such an important part uh, of defining any learning environment. Um, So uh, uncertainty, risks, as you fall down, then you get right back up. Yes, Surbi, you can, you can share it in the chat if, you, if you're not able to access Jamboard from your device. There's someone who says points and leaderboard. Okay, uh, so if everyone has sort of shared their uh, responses, all right, let's 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 allow a few more minutes for uh, people to yeah. just refresh their pages. Someone says something inclusive for all types of learners. Hmm. Subi says instant feedback, chance to get another shot in the game, teamwork. Yeah, the sense of, of failure as, as um, a step to mastery then, instead of failure just being a setback, uh, like in traditional exams and other means of assessment. That's something that's really um, a great feature of games, digital board, video games, or any, any sorts of games. Leadership games, yeah. That's a, that's a very specific sort of game. Uh, I'd like to know how you would transfer something like that into the classroom is that playing more yeah. important than anything. I would also like to know, you know, what kind of game, games you're referring to. For example, something inclusive for all types of learners. Um, I mean, on some of the sports uh, days, I used to feel that this is just something not for me. So uh, are, you specific, are you referring to either a sports game or a digital game? Um, if you would write um, what kind of game you're referring to, I think that would 
really make the conversation very interesting because there are some very very uh, intriguing points coming up playing more important than winning yeah yeah that is certainly one of the things with games so um since we've gotten a few responses in the chat and on the jam board i just like to now sort of summarize it um a lot of these answers that we've seen here um the question i'd like to ask here is uh, these are not unique features to games at least not naturally right um just to bring your perspective to the fact that naturally all animals all species uh, of animals uh, they come with this feature of play as a means to learn so when you're talking about uh, think about the kitten who's play wrestling or the little puppy who chases the ball that you throw or uh, the best example of a scientist the, the little human baby who goes around exploring the world conducting these experiments through play to try and find out how they can interact with objects how these objects interact with each other they form these theoretical mental models of how everything works but they, these are inbuilt these are innate qualities that um, all animals have and somehow we've managed to take this fun out of learning so uh, over generations we've somehow managed to create this rigid framework this education system that is so distinct from play and games whereas learning is actually a subset of play all play includes some form of learning and um, to stress upon the fact that these are the first hand experiences uh, that a game brings to anyone so in the world when you're interacting you are in the shoes of whoever's experiencing these events which is exactly what a simulated environment like a game does so you have these artificial rules and you go around exploring without any guide book or rule book you can pick any game and figure it out in a like someone said about the ux um you can figure out the rules of this game and how to achieve your objectives within those constraints so uh, we are all naturally tuned to this play and somehow uh, we fail to see that it's not very different so if we talk about players of a well designed video game many people spoke about failure as a step to learning and um how you get better so players of a well designed game are hooked to problem solving and learning they motivated by displays of mastery and they consider failure as a step to learning which are all probably uh, you have uh, game designers and educators right now the problem is they're not the same person and uh, game designers do an excellent job of uh, having all of these features in their games so these qualities that you would ascribe to these players are actually what you desire in a student in the ideal learning environment as well so half of our work is already done because uh, game design is already so uh, well crafted in such a way that you just have to identify how to bridge these two together now so before we uh, go on in depth into game based courses uh, we'll speak a bit about social and uh, emotional learning yeah thanks so much uh, vignesh um so let's talk a little bit about social and emotional learning at the very beginning we posted an emoji about uh, you know when we were introducing ourselves about how we're feeling and i think that just that mere um, act of finding an appropriate emoji to that depicts your current mood uh, forces us to reflect um, with how we're feeling at the moment so but why is checking in with ourselves and our mood so important i mean isn't the goal i mean to be always be is is the goal to be always be happy or excited say if i am feeling very tired right now is is my goal just to be um excited or happy all the time um no so if you're feeling angry or bored or tired today it's important to recognize that emotion that specific emotion and accept it not as a way to stop feeling sad or stop feeling bored but as a means to recognize your feeling uh, we're all humans and we can't always feel happy or calm um, i mean even zen buddhists probably don't feel calm 24/7 but labeling our emotions would be the first step towards solving deeper problems it could be you know something as personal or simple as you know okay i'm feeling sad and then i realize that 
okay, I'm probably feeling sad because I haven't talked to any friend for about two weeks now. So let me let me go ahead and make that call. Uh, or it could be about larger issues, um, say realizing that you feel really, really angry about something like climate change. Uh, and you take a step back, uh, gather yourself, become fully aware about your emotions, the, where it's coming from, uh, what are your motivations, um, and find ways to use that emotion constructively in a way that doesn't overwhelm you or it does not crush you, uh, but makes a very constructive um, uh, you know, action out of it. So everyone wants to feel better in the future, but it's probably more important to pay attention to how we're feeling right now. And it's, uh, it's almost like a part of um, our daily uh, self-assessment. Um, and um, so coming, I mean, again, talking about, you know, uh, social emotional learning and um, its need in the classroom space itself is, you know, the kind of, we realize even as we grow as adults, especially under the pandemic, we realize the importance of our own mental health, of um, taking care of our well-being. And uh, as we grow up, we realize that the kind of interactions we have with people, the way we learn, how we mo how mo motivated we are when we fail, how resilient we are in the times of crisis, how kind and caring we are towards ourselves and towards others, uh, whether you know it's our team, our students, our family, our friends, is all determined by our SEL skills. Uh, and not by our grades or our ability to solve co complex calculus problems or to remember um, information uh, that, that we memorized as kids. Uh, sadly, most of our formal education uh, leaves us highly unequipped to handle our own emotions. And time and again, we are reminded that beyond our ability to remember facts and memorize dates, uh, these are the abilities that help us lead meaningful lives to help us be leaders and problem solvers in a way that is empathetic, kind, and compassionate. So coming to MGIP's um, social emotional learning framework is, uh, it, it's something that we call EMC squared, uh, a play on um, Einstein's equation. Uh, I think the physics purists can kill us afterwards <laughs> and write angry emails to us. But EMC Square here stands for Empathy, Mindfulness, uh, Compassion, and Critical Inquiry. Uh, what do each of these SEL competencies stand for? So empathy for the fellow human being, mindfulness for the task at hand, compassion for pro-social action and behavior, and critical inquiry to really question and critically think about the decisions we make and why we make them. So uh, these are uh, some of the key SEL competencies that we integrate into all of our online courses and are certainly a part, major component of all our game-based courses. Uh, so let's move to poll two. Yes. So you'll see um, a poll question pop up uh, on your screen. Yeah. Uh, so for those of you who can't see the poll, uh, Anurati, can you just read out the options? So. Yeah. OK. So can games be used for SEL? Yes, no, maybe. If you can't see the poll, the uh, Vignesh, we've, um, are you there? Yeah, sorry, my Zoom crashed, I'm just. Yeah, so uh, I'll just type it out on the chat. Can games be used for social and emotional learning? And I think in the previous um, poll, we answered the fact whether we think that games can be used for learning. Uh, now just let's answer it at a deeper level, whether games can be used for social and emotional learning. And yes. Yeah, no. we've got, we have 
uh, 27 out of 34 votes in. Okay, so what is what are some of the early polling results? Uh, well, there's no no, uh, sort of. That's the audience, uh, but we have quite a quite a lot of people who say yes, and there are a few who also say maybe. Um, so we're waiting for seven people. If we've gotten a few responses in the chat, I think we can close the poll now. Again okay. says uh, yes as well. Okay. Just share the results. So again, there's no, no. So that's that's great. Uh, <laughs> so 23 people have said yes, games can be used for learning. And four people have said maybe games can use for, be used for learning. So, okay. Okay. so let's try and figure out whether they can come to the yes side. So um, we spoke about games and the first person nature of the experience right before we uh, spoke about SEL. Now the thing about um, teaching SEL is you need to create experience-based uh, interactions so that the student experiences those emotions and therefore we can build the skills of EMCC. Now what games do with the help of these first person experiences is that they, instead of observing, um, an event, the student is now embodying the character in this particular event. So the first person nature makes it such that their sympathy is now transformed into empathy. And at the Institute, when we create courses on SEL, we use this digital, digital pedagogical framework called Libre. So for um, those of us who are not from uh, an education background, a uh, digital pedagogical framework like Libre helps instructional designers and course creators have guidelines on what sorts of um, milestones and what sorts of uh, beacons to use when they create these uh, interactions, engagements, these activities. So Libre consists of five different um, sub-pedagogical tools. There's dialogue. So uh, what dialogue does is we embed discussion-based activities where um, you encourage the learners to engage in dialogue with their peers. So there's a lot of peer learning happening within the course. Uh, there's reflection, which then invites the learner to reflect upon an event or a, a situation. So, and then there's inquiry, which is again, asking a leading question to um, the learner to then have them inquire about that uh, condition or situation and form a sort of better understanding of the concept. And there's gamification and storytelling. Gamification is what motivates and encourages the student to keep uh, them hooked onto the entire course. We have gamification in there so that the students are motivated to um, achieve their objectives within modules and uh, complete the entire course. But at the heart of Libre is storytelling. Storytelling is the central narrative, the hook that keeps uh, the learner engaged right from the very beginning of the course through all of the modules. Uh, usually when we create courses, non-game based courses at the Institute, uh, we craft these stories ourselves. Um, we create characters and we sort of use that as the, the central narrative. But here are these games with uh, very well crafted stories, um, especially a lot of the ones that we've used are very heavily story driven games with uh, really credible characters. And we do not have to do the job of then um, making the student feel invested in them. The students have already uh, engaged in this game and now they feel for the characters. They know them so much better and they, they can think like the characters. Now using these um, qualities that these games provide us, how can we identify events from these games that can be then removed from the game and um, put against a global context or outside of the confines of the game context itself? So try to identify skills that can be taught through the game, through the events experience in the game, uh, reinforce those events and get them to inquire and reflect upon those uh, events and sort of form a wider understanding of uh, SEL, EMCC, any of them, if there are a lot knowledge components, better. That's really great if, you, if a game can have more than one thing, one, uh, not only SEL, but knowledge components as well. So um, we have 
a, a five-step process of creating game-based courses. It, right at the very beginning is uh, sort of selecting what game to use. Uh, this is usually when you're starting to create game-based courses, this, is, uh, this can be difficult unless you are very familiar with games, you're a gamer or someone who spends a lot of time just consuming a lot of uh, pop culture uh, about around games, you might find it difficult to find the right sort of games. So when we started at the Institute, what we did was uh, we reviewed a lot of the works done by others as well. So Games for Change has, an, uh, has a very vast uh, library and archive of uh, games that they think are suited for SEL. Uh, Common Sense Media has lots of blog posts and information about that. And we went around picking from other commercially available games and we played them at the Institute and we created our own catalog. So MGIP has, our, we have our own games catalog where we've identified components of EMCC. And then we started playing the games within the team. Uh, within the team, once after playing the game, we, we get back together and we discuss what sort of uh, skills or learning outcomes can be taught uh, from this game. So the, the things that are just uh, apparent at the, at the first uh, playthrough. So once we have a sort of idea about, okay, this game ha does this really well, uh, it can be used to teach empathy. Uh, we take that game and then we take it to a co-design workshop where we invite students uh, who are the target audience for these games. So we held a bunch of co-design workshops where we invited the students to play these games that we had shortlisted and then asked them to share their views on how we could um, include just to see if the sort of things that we found evident through the game was something that they also saw. Once this was done, it was then important to identify the events in the game that lend itself to being uh, pulled out of the context of the game. And um, an instructional designer can build activities around it to reinforce that experience. So these are pause points within the game. Uh, it's important that you play the entire game and understand it so that you have a clear idea of okay, this is a very good uh, experience and event in the game that can be used to teach these, these, these things. And um, then comes the, uh, the process of designing these activities itself. So when we have the learning outcomes, we have the, the sort of skeleton, the framework of the course ready. Uh, once you identify the pause points, then you can pull in for different modules. You can have separate activities that relate really well to that uh, event in the game. And then uh, we go on to integrating the assessment. So certain objective style um, engagements within the course can be assessed uh, pretty quickly. There are also subjective uh, style uh, dialogic, and there are different sorts of long form responses also that we require the users to fill in. They have a separate sort of assessment, uh, but this is broadly the five step process of creating any game based course. So this has been We've done it over the past one and a half years and we've gotten to a point where this is how we now use, approach any new game-based course. Um, Anurathi, would you like to speak, uh, would you like to share your screen for the, okay, I'll just speak a bit about um, these two games that we're going to highlight uh, today. Uh, so based on this process, uh, we've created a bunch of game-based courses, but today we'll be speaking about Bury Me My Love and Glee. Both of these are, uh, heavy in terms of story uh, but the way in which they convey the narrative is vastly different uh, one is heavy on dialogue and text and there's a lot of reading involved but it's very accessible to everyone very me my love and it's a story of uh, it's based on real experiences real life events and um, gree on the other hand uh, is a more abstract tale but it is also filled uh, with very heavy emotions um, and we've sort of taken both of these games to create our course and all of these courses are available on framerspace.com um, with these two along with a bunch of other game based courses and um, courses on climate change uh, global citizenship there are a few more uh, it's free for anyone uh, please go and check it out um, anurathi will now share uh, more about the greek course see you in a bit thank you so much uh, vignesh uh, so i'll uh... Yeah, thank you. Uh, so Gree is um, is a simply put is an adventure platform game, and um, so let me just share my screen. Yeah, 
I'll just wait for the screen to load up. Um, so Agri is um, simply put, it's an adventure platform platformer game. Uh, but uh, honestly, it's uh, so much more than that uh, because of a very, very strong storyline. Uh, so here we follow the journey of this young girl who is uh, grieving a certain kind of loss. Uh, it's not depicted or told in any way what kind of loss is it. Um, the whole story is told in the form of beautiful watercolor visuals. So there is no text, uh, there's only sound and there's only visuals. So it's highly accessible in the terms that there isn't uh, a specific language that this game adheres itself to. There is also no dialogue uh, and we get to experience her state of mind uh, through the way she sounds, through the way she looks, um, the kind of landscapes she finds herself in. And we see her move through different stages of um, loss uh, and follow her journey of loss um, and really get to experience it with, with her. So why don't we watch to get more context about what exactly this game is. So I'd like to show you a few snippets from the game so that we can later talk about how we use this game to create two different game-based courses. So the one that I'll be talking about today is called Of Loss and Love, which will be live in January publicly available on famouspace.com um, called of loss and Lo of love and loss and uh, January 2021 it should be freely accessible uh, and, but there's an, also another game based course that we've created uh, using the same game on art appreciation and how to inculcate empathy and critical inquiry uh, by learning the, some tools of um, visual art um, you know visual art analysis uh, so let's watch the small snippet.
Yeah. Um, so um, I would love to um, let me just stop my sh screen share for a while. I think that was such a such an emotionally charged uh, video clip. Um, if people on the chat could write about what were the kinds of emotions you felt while viewing this, uh, that would be great. Um, uh, and uh, I mean, uh, I would love to hear a little bit from you about the kinds of emotions that went through. I um, I don't know your uh, name, ma'am, uh, but you had switched your video on and I saw you looking quite uh, distressed, um, especially in the last video clip. Uh, and um, uh, I think uh, when we played the game, we were quite, uh, you know, that it was such an emotionally charged game in the in the first uh, level itself. There was so much of, you know, the, she can't move ahead. Uh, she loses her voice. So, uh, you know, there is some sense of things not being right or things being very unpleasant for her. Uh, she cannot move forward in her life. Uh, and all of these clips are from different levels of the game. So the second one where you saw the red landscape, 
um, there's a lot of anger and there's a lot of frustration, uh, a lot of blocks being destroyed. Um, uh, and the third one was really about, uh, you know, her going um, right into the depths and this eel chasing her. And for a long time, we don't know what's going to happen. Is she going to survive? Is she going to be okay? And then she's finding the light in the darkness. It's completely dark. Uh, and then finally, when she emerges out of the, the you know, out of the deep underwaters with the turtle, I mean, at least I, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, could breathe a sigh of relief, even though it's like my fourth, fifth time seeing this clip uh, and, you know, watching this uh, clip, it still has an emotional effect uh, on me. I think um, someone has, uh, Amra has her um, uh, hand raised. If you could unmute yourself. Hi, I'm Radhi. I hope you guys can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. It's It was quite anxious throughout, from the beginning uh, till almost the end. And uh, for some reason, you could like uh, sort of like connect each um, emotion to something that you have that you experienced in your life. So it was very reflective that way. And, and to see that, you know, coming up again is not like an easy journey to see that you sort of like have to go through it all to come to a sort of like a positive outcome. So that's something that I felt towards the end, actually. So uh, thank you so, so much for sharing that clip with us. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts uh, with us. And we completely resonate uh, with you. And, you know, um, here Ross on the chat says that uh, he found the graphics and animation very pretty and very engaging. Um, so let's, um, so we, okay, yeah, it's indeed like watching a moving watercolor painting. Uh, that's true. Um, let's, uh, why don't we take a short uh, five minute break um, and let's just collect our thoughts uh, before we move ahead. Uh, so after the break, after this fi short five minute break, I'll be introducing you to the, to, to the game based course, where we use the same game to define learning outcomes related, related to grief education. And I think specifically in the time of pandemic, uh, you know, all of us have faced certain kinds of loss, whether it's just the loss of a normal life, a routine life or the loss of a loved one. And and um, we've tried to find ways to uh, make grief education more accessible through this game-based course and the very nature of a game where, you know, Amra said she, she could really feel what uh, grief was feeling. We've tried to take it a step ahead. Um, so it's almost 11.58 right now. So about 12.3, 12.04, we'll get back. Just uh, leave my share screen. Okay, Vignesh has done that. Thank you so much, Vignesh. So we meet again uh, at 12.03? Yes, 12.03 okay. we meet. Uh,
Um, so I hope that everyone is back. Yeah. Uh, so I was just playing some uh, of the mindfulness music that we have incorporated into the course as well. I think uh, because these uh, these uh, graphics themselves are so emotionally charged. Um, I want to show you that you know. Um, in the game based course we've ensured that every uh, any such graphic or any such information is always followed by uh, a brief mindfulness exercise whether it be you know just taking a short 3 minute break for yourself to collect yourself um or it be listening to calming music or just drawing out your thoughts um okay just let's just wait uh, for a second is everybody back can we have a show of hands? Please raise your hands if you're all back or react to the chat. Okay. Okay, well, I see one raised hand. Okay. Uh, is my screen visible to you? So let's talk a little bit about the game-based course and what was the exact process that we um, used and that Vignesh um, talked about. Uh, I'd be showing that uh, you know, through examples of how we use that same process in defining this game-based course. So when we uh, looked at the, at the game, it, talk, it had really powerful themes related to grief, um, uh, a lot of storytelling, a very, very powerful story um, related to loss uh, and we one of the courses that we created were on grief uh, grief education uh, for an age group of um, um, roughly 16 to 18 uh, and above uh, uh, so we created this course um, the course is a result of a collaboration between UNESCO MGIP and Dr. Catherine Shear who is um, director at Center for Complicated Grief uh, Columbia University and uh, the game-based course consists of four modules. So that's Dr. Catherine Shear, whom we were very grateful for her to be a part of this uh, game-based course. Uh, one of the first things that we did is to really define what were the kinds of learning outcomes that we wanted for this game-based course. Uh, so of course, there, was, there were the EMCC competencies uh, of empathy, specifically self-compassion in times of grief, uh, mindfulness, uh, to bring back your thoughts, to, to be able to com be compassionate towards uh, anyone else and even to yourself. Mindfulness is a very important part. Um, then subject matter and knowledge of grief. So we defined some of the learning outcomes related to, to that. And we basically came up with four modules, which correlated to four different pause points, the pause points that Vignesh talked about. So we found out that there were four points where we wanted the learners to stop the game and come to the game-based course before they moved ahead. So these were uh, the four pause points correlating with each of the four modules. So the first module is, um, is on understanding emotions, on self-awareness, uh, on labeling emotions, defining an emotional vocabulary for yourself. Uh, what exactly is emotional recognition? 
The second one was an understanding loss. What is the meaning of a loss at an individual level, at a societal level? How does it impact our emotions? What are the various emotions associated with loss? Uh, the third one was on understanding grief. Uh, so taking loss and um, going a bit further on the loss of a loved one. The third module was on understanding grief. How can we learn a little bit about empathy and compassion um, to both be kind to ourselves and to be kind to others when they are grieving? The fourth one lays out a few strategies uh, to adapt to grief. Uh, when I say strategies, they're mostly ways to ensure that the learner knows uh, to acknowledge the nature of grief, to accept grief as a part of life um, as and find that you know humans have an innate capacity to adopt adapt uh, to grief and to move ahead with grief and not uh, despite it uh, and to integrate it uh, into your life and to not let loss derail uh, some aspects um, any or any aspects of your life. So I'll walk you through uh, module one and um, because we have a few other uh, activities planned so I'll try to finish this um, in around seven minutes. Okay. So this is module one, which is on emotional awareness and emotional recognition. We make sure that, uh, you know, because we're dealing with such an overwhelming subject matter of grief, uh, we make sure to use a lot of storytelling aspects, a lot of gamified aspects of uh, checking in um, to make, make the learners feel welcome uh, to be a part of the course so there is a course mascot who will be checking in with you to see how how's your day been going for, so far uh so there are some a lot of information concepts that are given either through graphics uh, infographics videos uh, interactive stories so here you see a graphic defining emotional episodes for example that your emotional state is defined both by any physical change or any psychological uh, change that you might feel. So um, after giving this information, we ask the user or learner to reflect on the physical changes that you may experience at the moment and uh, what thoughts and feelings might describe your current emotion. So basically making them understand the difference between any physical change or any psychological change. For example, uh, I might feel that my shoulders are a bit tight or my neck feels a little tensed. Um, and I, uh, I might say that my current emotion is uh, somewhat nervous. So these are two different components of my emotional state. And uh, this, this is to really set the basis of even empathizing with some other person so that, you know, when we see that someone looks a little tensed, uh, we might know that, okay, this person is not, is feeling a little nervous, maybe I should extend a little bit of kindness to the other person. Uh, but before we go to that other part, really defining it for our own selves is, um, is, uh, is what is the necessary step. And uh, to do this, we, we of course use the game here. So uh, when you go down through the other modules, you, you'll see that we ask the users to see that you know okay you've seen gree uh, uh, in that particular video clip so now define what were some of the physical changes and what were some of the psychological changes that she uh, you could witness so but we word it in a way that um the student uh, gets engaged in the topic because the the game itself is so first nature it's almost as if gree is someone you know because you so fully fully immerse yourself into her emotion so what are some of the things she might be feeling? Um, so if you if if people could write down on the chat when you see this uh, when you saw this particular section on the clip, what were some of the things that you think that she was uh, feeling? I mean, for if you could just type it on the chat, that would be great. Um, okay, a sense of loss. Mm -hmm. loneliness pain despair there's a lot of pain sadness and what were some of the 
physical changes that told you uh, that she is uh, experiencing this because this is entirely visual so how did you get to know that she's feeling this way uh, was it something about her walk uh, the fact that she lost her voice um, drooping body posture falling down these are some great examples no smile on her face really important looking down yes so um sad eyes yes i think that's important trying to get back but falling down so this feeling of um just trudging along and not being enough uh, lethargic tired uh, face eyes all emotion so so these this is some of this is these are one of the ways that we have tried to uh, inculcate empathy within the learner to help them understand to to look at someone else and define and see and guess what their emotional state might be and respond in a way that would be constructive to the interaction so after we give uh, all of this uh, information uh, we go a bit step further where we inquire whether um, the learner has experienced a similar emotion or felt the same way in their life we also give them another information component of the Uh, you know emotional wheel so their emotional vocabulary really develops that there are all kinds of emotions that are out there um and uh, it's okay to feel any of them uh more video components and this ends with a mindfulness activity uh and also we ask the learners to kind of draw on this canvas about their exact mood after uh, they listen to this piece of music so um on the on the second module uh, there is a bit of storytelling but i won't get into that i would urge you to get on to framerspace.com so you can see a lot of these game based courses especially on dri of florence and barimima love which vignesh will talk about uh, so okay Uh, so i think i'll uh, vignesh uh, i'll um, i'll i'll keep on sharing my screen right no i i'll share i'll share okay i'll stop sharing just typing the link to frame space for anyone who's missed it okay i'll i'll do it you go ahead okay. okay yeah that was pretty heavy the last 20 minutes on uh grief and um well i don't have another more uplifting game but it's a it's a different sort of a problem that we tackle with very my love um i'll give you a bit of information about the game itself very me my love um is a game that was uh, developed by um it wasn't developed for profit initially it was based on um real life experiences of refugees so it's a story of noor who's a syrian refugee uh, who's trying to escape the crisis in syria and rebuild a life in europe um the interesting thing here about this game is that you do not play as uh, noor you play as her husband majid who can only uh, interact with noor over the messaging app on their phones so um Majid has not been able to he, he would have liked to but he could not accompany Noor on her journey since he was he had to take care of his ailing mother uh, so we created a course called um identity in crisis sorry that was hidden by my face we had a course called identity in crisis where what we do is um we put the player into the shoes of Majid and try to extrapolate that outside the context of the game uh, we'll be sharing a short video clip about the game itself um just to let you know what sort of um interface the game plays on it's very accessible to everyone since it's just a chat interface there are lots of dialogues so occasionally through her entire journey not occasionally often through her entire journey um noor contacts majid to update him on her status where she is and uh, more crucially she asks majid for advice or um choices so you are put in the shoes of this person who is so far away from someone he's trying to help and his choices the choices that you as a player make for noor uh, will have consequences the game has 19 different endings and most of them are not very happy the first time i played it uh, 
I finished it in about one and a half hours and it wasn't a very happy ending. So I had to go back again to try and see. It was a completely different journey. So the way the game incorporates choice uh, makes you feel completely invested in the story and as if you know Noor, as if you're connected to Noor and you are Majid. So uh, I, I'm not sure if you can hear the video on my Do you want to share the video? Yeah. Okay. Let me share, uh, share the screen, just a second. It's a short video clip. Um, it's about five minutes. Uh, where we, uh, I'd like you to have an understanding of what the game is like, what the uh, interactions are like, so that I can then tell you more about how we managed to create um, activities around it. Can you see it? I can't, it's still loading for me. Yeah, it's loading. Thank you. 
we'd have uh, we'd have loved for you to actually be able to play the game. Um, but hopefully this gives you a sort of idea into um, the sort of game this is. It's very different from how Gree plays. Uh, and if you noticed at certain points, you have these um, chat options that show, show up. So you can react in different ways to a question that Node asks. Um, and that puts you into situations where she, she would have, if uh, Node chooses Damascus, it's another completely different story. And she ends up in one of the, uh, I think, 17 countries or so. Uh, or um, it goes another way altogether if you choose something else. So you have your actions have consequences. Uh, another thing is the text in the chat itself, in the game itself, has been um, co written, has been reviewed by refugees who made it to Germany somewhere in 2014, 2015. So this provides, this game, when we first played it, we realized that this has a lot of potential to not only teach empathy and compassion, but also understand the global refugee crisis. Um, I won't be going too deep into the entire course like Anurathi did with Pri. Uh, however, I will show you um, how we managed to create these um, little activities. So two activities here, very similar to the ones that you engage in within the game. Uh, Anurathi, can I just, uh, can you sh stop the share? Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, so here we created two activities that are very similar to the one that you see in the game itself. Uh, during the entire story, uh, Noor mentions briefly about her friend Yara. Uh, and you get a sense of uh, Yara being um, a, a long, a, an old friend of Noor's, but you never really know much about Yara. So here, through the activity, what we've tried to do is, um, since you spend so much time interacting with, with Noor, we then have the learner um, embody Noor and sort of think about uh, the entire um, journey and then get back to Yara. What would Noor say to Yara in such a situation? We did the same thing uh, with Majid, uh, where since you've played Majid, you have a sort of understanding of what he's feeling. Um, and then in this activity here, uh, you have to go back to a time in the past and sort of fill in the blanks and uh, get an idea of what Noor and Majid must be talking about. Apart from these activities, we have a bunch of other. Um, so the entire first module is about uh, the refugee crisis. So there we try to explain the difference between um, an asylum seeker, a migrant and um, um, a refugee. Um, the second module goes more on about identifying yourself. It's about identity. And the third module is about home and belonging, where you're sort of fitting your identity into the grand uh, system and the society around you. So Bury Me My Love is uh, one of our first uh, large scale studies that we're conducting now. It will be completed this month. I see um, someone has asked about the efficacy. So we started in uh, August with this study involving 600 students in two countries, 10 schools, UAE and India. Uh, how we conduct such a study is by using uh, standardized assessment tests. So these standardized pre and post assessment tests are um, based, they have questionnaires that, they are questionnaires that have questions on uh, empathy, compassion, self and for the other. Uh, these are standardized tests, these are published in journals, and they have a sort of a scoring system where the students' responses are gauged. And what we do is we have all 600 students play the game first, then all 600 of them take the pre-assessment test. 300 of those students then go on to take the course. And after uh, the course, uh, which takes about, uh, depending on the school and curriculum, a lot of enthusiastic teachers hold a lot of group discussion and activities during their uh, regular school duties as well. So it's taken between four to six weeks, uh, varying from school to school. And in it, at the end of these six weeks, we invite them again to take a post assessment, which has similar questions as the pre assessment. And uh, even the ones who did not take the course are invited to take that uh, post assessment. Then we compare the scores between the post and pre assessment, uh, hoping that there's a change in the post assessment. And uh, the, the, the group that hasn't played the game. Uh, sorry, hasn't taken the course is our reference. So we can accurately sort of calculate the efficacy of a game-based course itself. The game itself is very useful to teach a concept, but we believe that it's important to take that uh, gameplay experience and reinforce all of these learnings later. There's like a debrief of the entire experience. Otherwise, it just ends up being something you learn, but you don't really form 
a solid understanding of the concepts. So um, the study ends this month and hopefully sometime uh, first half of next year, we plan on publishing the results and uh, that gives us a more solid sort of um, backing, uh, scientific backing to these um, game-based courses that we are creating. So there's some things happening next year. We will keep you um, in the loop about that as well. Um, that's it about Bury Me, My Love. Uh, next, we have uh, an activity uh, for you. Someone is asking about uh, GRI as well. Uh, so GRI, uh, because the grief uh, course will be made public um, first month of next year. So we hope to implement the game-based course uh, next year uh, and conduct the study then. So the results of Bari Me My Love will be uh, out soon next year, but we would be implementing the other game-based course next year. Uh, Vignesh, do we want to take out like five minutes for some questions if uh, people yeah. might have? So Damika asked me for links to the videos that we showed, um, the Gree video and the Bari Me My Love. Could you paste it in the chat? Yeah. Agree is the next course we will be implementing um, following Bury Me My Love. If, if you have any questions, any feedback, anything you'd like to share with us based on our approach, if something's not clear, if you'd like us to um, go in depth about some things, we can do that now. Just please raise your hand. So, uh, and it would be nicer, though not required, it would be nicer if we can have audio so that um, for those of us who are on devices that can't. Uh, do video, audio, and chat at the same time. Might be helpful for them. Yeah. And all of these uh, games are available on, um, uh, now they're available both on phones as well. So you'll find it on uh, the Android Play Store or the iOS Store. You can also download them on Steam. Uh, and apart from that, um, there are some resources like Common Sense Media um, and the Games for Change catalog that have a lot of these games that uh, touch upon pertinent social issues. Uh, which age group do, do these games cater to? So the games are actually meant for um, anybody who is, uh, who can um, who, who can log on to Steam. So I think that's about 13 and above. Uh, however, the game-based course is designed for specific um, age group and audience. So for the, for the Bari Me My Love course, it's about 14 and above. Uh, for the GRI art appreciation course, it's about 16 and above. And for the grief course, it's roughly to, you know, there's, we're still debating upon the exact age, but um, it's either from 16 to 18 uh, and above. And we have courses which are say, this, for example, there's Florence, which is meant for even a younger audience, about 14 and above which we've used to create a game-based course. We also have World Rescue, which is for an even younger uh, 11 or uh, 12. Uh, it was actually developed by MGIP. Uh, so it's free to play as well. You can download it on your phone and play that. And there's a course on Framer Space. It teaches concepts of mathematics and along with um, SEL. Okay, why don't we start with the final activity because we're in the final half an hour and this one is a fun activity that we've planned, quite different from the mood of uh, the past 30-40 minutes, which has been uh, quite serious, uh, but in this activity, um, Vignesh, would you like to uh, yeah. define what it would do? So, uh, yeah, so the past two games are pretty heavy and uh, very story based games. And as much as we would like for you to have engaged in actually playing and not just watching videos of them, it would have been, uh, it just makes it the constraints of this two hour workshop make it impossible for us to have an in depth sort of experience with playing a game. Uh, so, in the future, we might have workshops next month, uh, next year, uh, more often, where we will have longer form workshops that involve playing. But right now, we'd still like you to at least go through uh, the first one or two steps of creating a game-based course. So we've taken something, uh, we're going to go back uh, 30 years in the past, um, sorry, 30 years in the past, and we'll play Tetris altogether uh, for about five to 10 minutes. 
and we believe that um, it's possible to derive learning outcomes even from a game as simple as Tetris. Uh, I'm sure most of you have played, most of you probably were addicted to it and finally managed to get out of it. And sorry for uh, bringing this back to you. Um, so what we will do is uh, this link uh, we paste in the chat. Uh, please go onto that web page, play Tetris for however long you think you need to sort of figure out what can be learned. It doesn't have to be specifically SEL, though we think there are some SEL components that also can be learned through this. Um, but uh, feel free to sort of go wild with your uh, interpretations of the game and what can be taken out of it to teach. If you had a bunch of students, if you had 10 students to tell some tell something to about Tetris, what would you do? And below that, we have a link to the Padlet. I will just show you what the Padlet looks like. Once you've played the game or simultaneously while you're playing the game, please go on to this link. Uh, the Padlet has two columns. The first one is, uh, what did you like about the game? And the second one is, what can we learn from the game? So what did you like about the game? Could be something simple like, okay, nostalgia, it was fun, I remember my childhood, uh, anything, anything, whatever you seem fits into there. What we can learn uh, should be something that you think can be taught with this game. So let's take another five minutes or so to play the game. Uh, yeah. Once you have a few responses, yeah. Once you have a few responses, we can come back and discuss it. Um, Let's also please uh, paste the link to the Padlet. Yeah, I'm doing that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, think of it as you know, this is the textbook that has been assigned to you, and you have to create some sort of a uh, lesson uh, or some. You're told to just teach this in a classroom. What would you do? Here is the link to the Padlet. Vignesh, would you like to play uh, a little bit of Tetris for us? So in the past two sessions, uh, I was actually screen sharing while playing and then I realized like the people in the chat are so much better. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I could do that, but I'm a bit embarrassed. How about you share and you play while we all watch you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, then let's just leave it for the high schoolers. If anyone else wants to share the screen uh, and I'm really feeling confident about their Tetris skills. Yeah, we would like to see that. <laughs> Yesterday, someone went on to 4,000, 5,000, level four in like two minutes. Yeah. yeah. I was wondering whether the founders old screenshot or was it just in like the, the two minutes? <laughs> I see someone from Bhutan is here uh, in the participants list. Um, is the Padlet working? Can you guys just uh, maybe check? You just have to click on the plus button whether when you want to add a comment uh, uh, on the specific column, you are also free to add comments to what, I, what other people have written. So if you're having any problem using this Padlet, please let us know. I guess everyone is playing the busy playing the game. Are we?
and think as broadly as you can about the things that you can learn it doesn't have to have to be very serious it could be very uh, simple things like you know uh, just the fact that it helps you calm down or helps you strategize um, helps you learn shapes um, or different colors it could be as simple as that it's this is just a way to get a feeler of uh, how to play a game and um, find out the learning outcome for it can be used for all age groups uh, is definitely so visually as well and such a simple game pick up and just sort of get into yesterday we had yeah. someone who shared um, fitting in a sort of into a team where, where they thought of tetris where they were the block instead of you controlling the block you're more like how do you uh, conform to uh, certain situations or Conform in a very positive sense of the word, as in with a team, um, enhancing mm -hmm. focus and concentration, capturing the attention, or you can teach diversity and inclusion. That's very true with the colors and the shapes. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty metaphorical. Very nice. Um, yeah. Collaboration. Yes, there's so many different things have to come together. Again, to iterate, the, the link to the Padlet is on the chat. And uh, for anyone who's joined in new, um, we're playing Tetris and we're trying to find out the things that we can learn using Tetris. Uh, and we are putting down our thoughts on the Padlet link that has been shared on the chat. Quick strategic thinking, yeah. There's like this time limit and there's a constraint you get a bit uh, mm -hmm anxious as well while trying to um, achieve like those entire it's such an old sort of uh, game design old as in um, classic game design they're still being replicated in so many newer games but completely got carried away with the game yeah that does the uh, Anrathi do you have that experience as well you get into this state of flow yeah um, and you're playing Tetris and you just have uh, <laughs> uh, one singular objective <laughs> yeah, and you forget to eat and do uh, basic things, uh, eat, sleep. That's a bit too much <laughs> with Tetris. <laughs> Has that happened? Um, no, I mean, I think for some of the games, it's just been so long with Tetris, but you do get into this flow where you don't want to stop playing a certain game. Uh, so Pasna has a very interesting comment in the chat. She says that I'm. Uh, this was an absolute blast from the past. Uh, realize I have really realized I have really slowed down. Uh, this game can be used for conversations around fitting in, how communities come and work together, how we manage our excitement or frustration uh, while playing. But yeah, I think this is a very important point, and I, that's something that I didn't think about in this about the third workshop. That uh, you get, uh, there is a state of uh, a perfect game design where it just gives you enough and it does not give you enough to do in that certain level. So uh, you are achieving a little bit, but there's also a bit of a challenge that makes you uh, keep on going again and again. So there's a slight bit of, uh, you know, good frustration in the sense that I want to get better, uh, but it's not so complex that, okay, this is so frustrating. I can't get any of this. So let, let me just put it down. Uh, that just happens with, say, some of the textbooks that, you know, feel so distant, like, okay, I, I can't get this done. I'll just study a little bit before the test. So this, like, this concept of uh, being frustrated, but also being motivated at the same time to do better. Um, uh, and also then managing your own emotions, right? Uh, how do you manage that little bit of excitement mixed with uh, frustration while you're playing or learning? I think this is a very good point. Yeah, I agree with you, Anurati, and thank you, Pasna, for sharing that. I think that's that's the thing with uh, games as well, right? Like when you when you mentioned the textbook, I was thinking about how we had to, how we usually in school we prep first, uh, we sort of try to learn everything, and then we go and apply. But here you're learning as you're applying, and you're also being tested at the same time, and it gives you just the right amount of frustration. And so you build a bit of patience and resilience as well. And then you're rewarded for your mastery of that particular thing. Um, 
perspective there shared. Was Sorry, go ahead. Because uh, everyone's becoming so nostalgic, uh, you can also share uh, memories of any other games that you have where you were in the flow or you felt you were so engaged. I mean, one of my memories was playing Diner Dash. I was with some hundred levels of just giving food out to people, and uh, my family thought I had got gone crazy because I was in fifth grade, and all I used to do was come back home and just play Diner Dash all the time, uh, serving food to imaginary people. <laughs> uh, and, and if anybody wants to share their own, uh, you know, some games that they liked or they felt that were used for learning, we, we would welcome you, invite you to speak a bit about that, um, unmute, unmute yourself, and we would love to know your experiences. Yeah, maybe you didn't think about that game back then that it could be used for learning. But now with all your experience, you think about games that you played 10, 15 years ago and you're like, oh, I could have learned this or I could have... Maybe I did learn that. It's not useful maybe, too yeah, much. Maybe, yeah, exactly. Like it wasn't explicit, but uh, we, you did learn something out of uh, that experience. Yeah, strategic thinking, a lot of such games do uh, end up teaching you. Um, but it's very nice to see so many wide ranges of things that can be taught. So the objective of the activity was sort of to get everyone a bit warmed up about all games, just sort of broaden our perspective on how we see games. There's a lot of uh, uh, misconceptions as well on how games can be used. Personally, we think all games have some sort of learning that can be used. They might not all be in line with your curriculum. They might not be uh, really fit to take into the classroom because of violence and stuff. Um, but the core things can be borrowed from and that you don't have to use digital games either. You can use games that uh, you play as a group, tabletop games, board games, uh, things like those in your classroom. Uh, we have a bunch of teachers as well. Yes, yeah, so hopefully you got something out of this activity. Uh, Anrati, do you want to add something else? Yeah, I was just reading Dania's comment that, you know, it can be helpful in relaxing our minds in the times of stress and to help fight, help us fight with the negative clouds all around. So I think that has been one, uh, at least especially under the pandemic, just gameplay in general has become such a thing, right? I mean, I think a lot of us have had virtual nights where we play Pictionary with our friends or we conduct some sort of a Netflix party where it's some sort of an online uh, environment where we are able to interact uh, with one another uh, and just uh, help us calm us down. Even something like Candy Crush, uh, we've seen a lot of people playing that uh, on their way back home on the metro and how that could, could even be used to relax ourselves. Uh, yeah, I think, um, a lot of uh, comments on that padlet we could uh, go take any questions that you might have and then proceed to uh, closing uh, this uh, workshop we would love to hear any questions that you might have or anything related to the activity that we just did uh, just to add to what you said about uh, the pandemic and stress and stuff there have been recent papers in the past five, six years now that actually show Tetris is super effective for PTSD and anxiety. It's it's really great for mindfulness. Lots of other. I reasons. have a question. Can I ask? This yes, is please. Dania. Yes, please. Um, first of all, I'll I really like to appreciate you both. It's a very um, uh, innovative idea, and uh, uh, I, I am a psychologist and an educationist as well. Uh, if I relate those to the mind and the emotions in this time of pandemic, uh, do you really think that if a person is feeling stress uh, and in that time of stress, these type of uh, games can really help him or her? Have you done any such um, pilot testing or uh, work in this regard that if a person is really feeling upset or uh, like you have um, just said in the state of PTSD, so um, is it really beneficial to those who have been diagnosed with depression or PTSD? Uh, I will share the link to the study specifically about um, PTSD and Tetris. Mm -hmm. uh, this was done as in uh, to prevent flashbacks and stuff. So the, the idea, just an abstract, is that 
when you're playing tetris your visual spatial memory is so focused on what's happening it prevents recreating visual imagery of your traumatic experiences right at mgip we don't do such studies ourselves we basically do game based course uh, efficacy uh i'm just going to paste it in the chat yeah. uh but some of these games uh, are anecdotal but a lot of them have some scientific studies that have been done you can also find more about ptsd specifically mm-hmm. about uh, depression um i'm not sure if uh, tetris has been used for that and that you wanted to say something yeah i think uh, lots of serious games have which have been developed uh, with the int- intentionality of working on some certain scl components uh, they there are a few games that have done independent research studies uh, specifically on um, uh, mental health issues uh, i i would try to find out the links and if you could mail us at gamesforlearning@unesco.org um we would love to sh- share those those particular links but off the top of my head there's a game called that dragon cancer where um, which was actually developed uh, by uh, two people who who whose family was struggling with one of them having cancer and the kind of ptsd uh, that followed up and they conducted research studies um using that particular game so there are there have been some serious games which um have conducted such uh, research studies using game right actually i want to say uh, ask another thing that uh, the culture where i am living we have a, a lot of issue with language barrier Uh, right like you have developed this language in, in uh, this game in english uh, and most of the people are not very well acquainted with this language so uh, if i want to develop this language or if i want to um, um advertise this game to the other fellow beings uh, so uh, i'm just suggesting that uh, if there is any possibility that you in the future times you are going to translate these la- these games into other languages like i want to uh, get its translation in urdu language is there thank any possibility you. so thank you danya for that question uh, so some of the games that we try to pick up uh, for example gree is for the same reason that there's no text involved Mm-hmm. uh we we understand that there are lots of games that are uh, in the english language um and hence we have the push of people like you coming and attending this workshop to be inspired to create games for learning uh, get into the sector of games uh, games for learning um and to create more of such games but it's from our end um, the course on framework phase can be uh, put on google translate but the mm-hmm. games themselves um some of them are in english but it's our effort uh, to make them as use the uh, use the ones which are as visual as possible without mm. any text whatsoever so yeah great thank great. you for your question thank you anybody else i think uh, vignesh let's move on to the last slide yeah so um that is it for this workshop what we will now do is share in the chat a feedback link um where you can this is a feedback link which we'll we'll also use for the certification please do fill at least the first three sections where we ask for your first name last name and email uh please double check that you get all your uh, spelling everything right uh we will be sending the certificate sometime next week early next week mid next week along with it we will also send you resources so some of the things that we could not really go in depth but we have used for our own courses are um, things like the games catalog uh, how to find like we have a bunch of games uh, games for change has their own archive there's common sense media if you're an educator wanting to see how to include um, pop culture media into your classroom they have uh, very nice uh, reviews about stuff age appropriate things uh we'll share those resources with you um am i missing anything anurathi um no oh, i think you've covered most of it um uh, i've posted the feedback form on the chat please uh, do fill it out and it would help us improve uh, future workshops as well and learn from you what worked and what didn't and how can we make this experience uh, better for you going forward yeah those are completely optional questions but we really appreciate it if you could give us some feedback on how 
what you were looking for, how we could make it better. And hope to see you again in the, I'm just going to hide my face again so you can look at the email IDs. Uh, there's gamesforlearning at unesco.org. Uh, there's also A. Srivastava and v.mukun at unesco.org. Um, please feel free to contact us for any sort of um, collaboration, any questions, resources, sharing. We'd be happy to help. And look out for future workshop uh, emails, notifications on the website. We'll, uh, we'll be trying to do longer form workshops that will go on for, say, two days or so, so that we can get into a game more in depth and sort of break down the entire process. But hope this gave you a good idea of how we tackle this problem and uh, hope you take this back into your own practices and um, enjoy it. Enjoy getting students all interested for games and learning. Yeah. Um, anything about, yeah, this tech day three today in the evening at seven, final day. If you haven't been tuning in for the past two days, uh, we'll be closing today. There's a, um, there's a nice panel on digital pedagogy in these times of COVID. Uh, not a panel, sorry, a keynote. So Anurati, would you like to add anything? Uh, it was just very nice to have all of you here. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, yes, and I'm just so glad to have all of you here interact with us. Um, yeah. All right, then. This is where we say goodbye. Uh, thank you for attending. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. This is Danya. Please uh, take my feedback for your workshop. I want I want to share it with you. Daniel, um, uh, would you please share the feedback on the feedback? I have I have shared it, but I want to say it in front of all the participants that uh, among all the workshops, this is one of the best workshops because this is the most needed um, innovative thing in this time of pandemic. Uh, we we all are saying that we have not. Uh, uh, a, a lot of factors that can help us protect our mental health. So all of the participants who have been suffering with any sort of issues, I'll motivate them. I'll recommend them to just have a try uh, to these type of games that you have developed. And I'm pretty sure that these type of games will surely help them out while fi fighting or combating their mental health crisis or their mental health issues. Actually, this is very much, much relevant in this time of COVID-19 crisis, what I think and what I've, I'm feeling. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. That's very kind of you. That's good motivation as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. A great Sunday ahead. If you're thank you for keeping your video on. That was <laughs> pretty well appreciated. Yeah. Lots of books I see in the background. Okay, bye bye, everyone. Nice meeting you. Bye bye. Okay. See you. I hope everyone's got the um, link, feedback link, because I'm going to end the meeting in a bit. So if not, just please quickly ask or send us an email at Games for Learning with your name that you used to join the workshop. All right, have a good day. Bye-bye, see you around again in one of the- Have a nice day. Thank you. You bye -bye. too, bye-bye.